for the weirdlings. I do geek correspondence for the Daily Dot. Um, and we are also filming a feature on cosplay and 3D printing and all of the different capabilities of 3D printing that you can do cool stuff with cosplay, like burn your face off with a mask. <laughs> Don't burn your face off with a mask. Um, so first of all, we'll just uh, kind of introduce everyone. Um, this is Mia Moore. She runs exomia.com, which is her personal blog. And then she also uh, co contributes for a variety of other websites, uh, superhero-esque. Um, so I wrote this down. I wrote it all down. I was like, superhero-esque. I know that one. Oh, and the fake goth girls podcast, which is fairly new, isn't it? Yeah, I think we're like 17 episodes in. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about like your websites and what you do? Yeah, so Exo Mia, I write about um, style, cosplay, and live in the geek life. So I do a lot of like cosplay tutorials, tips and tricks, things like that. I try to make it so that even though I'm not like an expert, I try to help out people who are just getting started, don't know where to buy wigs, don't know how to get started. So if you if that describes you, check it out. Hopefully there's something that'll help you. Uh, Superhero-esque is all about becoming your own superhero. So it's kind of like a self-love, self-help site with kind of a geeky twist. Uh, and I co-founded that along with my best friend. And we also do a podcast called Fake Goth Girls, where we talk about geek news and lady issues and just kind of like shoot the breeze. Nice. Yeah. So right beside her is Jacob, a Re3D's design intern. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> Hi, Jacob. <laughs> How long have you worked for Re3D? Uh, about two, three months now. Okay. Like, yeah. Did you and did you have three D printing experience before that? I um in high school we had a I was in the STEM program in high school and we had a three D printer but it was crap and <laughs> um we had a we used Autodesk Inventor which was the greatest thing back in two thousand eleven or whatever um so woo woo uh when when I started at Re three D I picked up a whole new program that's one of the partners with Re three D and was able to completely design the hammer and that scythe uh, in just a, under a month and get him started printing. Rad. All right, and then we also have Bianca Danielle over here at the end who is cosplaying Hi. Ruby. Yay! She's a cosplayer and she also does uh, contributes for Daily Dot as well with their uh, esports program, the Loadout, or their esports show, The Loadout. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like your cosplay experience because I know you're kind of new to it. Oh gosh, okay. So I kind of started cosplaying on and off in 2012. My first convention was KatsuCon where I I did the thing that everyone does to start, and you buy a Halloween costume, and you mess it up a little bit in the best way. And so my first cosplay was as Nurse Akali from League of Legends. Um, from there, I have i haven't been branching out until this convention, actually. And my subsequent cosplays included Gnar, Pool Party Ezreal, Classic Akali, and right now I'm working on Star Guardian Lux, because I love League. But I also love Ruby, so here we are doing the cosplay thing, and I can't wait to talk to you guys about it. Here we find ourselves. So, <laughs> how many of you people feel like you have a, a good idea of how cosplay, or uh, how cosplay, how 3D printing works? Okay, so we got a good chunk of you. So, Jacob, can you tell us a little bit, for those people who are not, who don't know about how 3D printing actually technically works, can you tell them a little bit about it? Okay, so there's there's a few different kinds of 3D printing. Um, the kind that we specialize in is um, it's a nozzle that superheats plastic and pretty much lays it down like a hot glue gun. So what happens is it uh, you have a spool of your plastic or whatever material you're using, nylons, um, different types of plastics. Um, some I, I don't I'm not quite sure on the polymer ones because I haven't used any yet. Um, but it pulls the string into a heated uh, bed. Um, Hello. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Sorry I'm late, guys. <laughs> it makes a little bit of a, a, a pool of liquid plastic, and then it shoots it out just like a hot glue gun onto your bed. Uh, usually you'll have a raft printed on your bed so that your models can then be printed on top of that raft, and then the raft just breaks off at the end along with any supports. Um, that's the basic kind of 3D printing that how we use, um, and it's just layer by layer. So. Um, Every time you lay down a layer, the, heat, the bed is still heated, so it's going to be warm. They lay the next layer on top of it, and it's actually got a pretty decent uh, bond strength. And you can experiment with different bond strengths with different materials, and how, and even the temperature that you print out. So um, PLA, which is what we did for these guys, prints from anywhere from 195 to about 205 uh, degrees Celsius. And um, you can vary that depending on you know what you want to do with it. So I've heard it's it's kind of like a giant hot glue gun. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So it's yeah. 
Because Florida cosplayers love more than a hot glue guy. <laughs> Nothing. So really quickly, Oliver just joined us, so I want to make sure to introduce him. This is Oliver Luke. Uh, he is a special effects makeup artist. Uh, he actually did some special effects for a, uh, a really good indie movie about Casey Jones for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And if you haven't seen it, it's awesome. Um, his crank is fantastic. Um, but, you know, tell us a little bit about, like, how long you've been doing special effects. Welcome. Uh, Welcome to thank the Thank you. Yes. Hi. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry I'm late. I got uh, stuck <laughs> on traffic no, on the way I'm down from the Fort Worth. So. <laughs> um, were... I've been doing special effects uh, makeup for movies in the theater for, uh, I guess, over 10 years now. I hate thinking about how long ago. Anyway, um, but, uh, yeah, I've worked on uh, lots of zombie movies, horror, action, um, Pretty much anything you can name. And then um, I did uh, puppetry work for theater and uh, set design, um, creature creation, um, pretty much all of it when it comes to um, making things for entertainment. So, yeah. So the really cool thing and, and what is really exciting to me about 3D printing is it's really easy to think, you know, oh, well, you can make this three-dimensional object. But there are a lot of applications for special effects and cosplay and artists that 3D printing can really help with. Um, and I know a lot of everyone on this panel has really thought outside of the box in terms of what 3D printing can be used for. Um, so if you guys just want to, if you want to go down the line or if anybody wants to, to chime in, what kind of projects do you think, what kind of projects particularly inspire you when you think 3D print? Weapons. <laughs> Everyone That's goes weapons first. <laughs> weapons is the first thing. It's they're the easiest things to do. Um, and well, in certain softwares, um, a lot of CODs, uh, CAD softwares um, do very mechanical shapes, and so it's easy to do very symmetric, like nice weapons. Um, and so I would I would definitely start with weapons. Wearables are a little bit harder because you have to meld them to your body, um, and everyone has different bodies. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, like. Using a very mechanical software, it's hard to do organic shapes, and so um, you would use more like Blender or um, Maya for those. Mm -hmm. But you, those also have sh huge learning curves on them, so the AutoCAD ones are easier to pick up. Uh, but weapons is the short, the short answer. Weapons, <laughs> big weapons. I, now, Our favorite I, I kind of weapons. Sorry. Well, I was going to say that there, uh, there are a few FX companies out there that are starting to use it for armors, for your your armors that'll that'll fit on most people, so a general shape. Um, yeah, anything that's like a like a prosthetic or something along those lines. Yeah, you gotta you definitely have to fit it to the body to make it work um, and move really well. But like standard armors, that I, I think I was discussing with uh, Rebecca. Um, oh yes, there you are. Uh, we were discussing that the new um, Star Wars. Uh, that they worked on a lot of the armors and stuff for that. And so you're like stormtrooper type deal. Um, yeah, you're more fantasy stuff, your chain mail, things along those lines for your orcs and what non fantasy creatures. Yeah, that, I mean, that's not the type of stuff that you can really do with it right now. Actually, chain mail is. They are is, starting to do chain rings. Chain mail is yeah. amazing because you can perfectly, you can print the rings mm. inside of each other. Oh, that, no, that's neat. So yeah. Instead of like, having to weave the rings together, anybody that's uh, out there it's done chain mail. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to sit there and weave it. You don't have to yeah. do any like, metal so I've done that. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. You can print them inside so of each other. So there you go. So you can do some of the chain mail. So, um, yeah, so the it, even the armor then really yeah. is going to become a better application soon, too. And I, I'm sure once we, they can start altering some of the chemical structures of how the the makeups or the prosthetic pieces, I'm sure you could eventually be able to print some stuff like that, but I mean, nothing yet. Uh, yeah, we were actually talking about like cloths and stuff that yeah. we're starting to get in. Like um, Ninja Flex is a really great material okay. for like, you can have stuff that can bend and yeah. like, just imagine if you put like a, like you made like a chest piece mm -hmm. and then you put straps on the back or whatever, yeah. and then you pull those tight, it would like pull to you. To it. Yeah. yeah, so that would work for a lot of kinds of armor. Yeah, I was thinking, um, I'm working on an Imp Midna from Legend of Zelda, and she has this crazy headpiece, and right now I'm like making it out of foam and hot glue and wishes, but if I could just have 3D printed it, that would be amazing, and it would be so much easier, and it would look so much better, and uh, I think just any time that you need to replicate something, and I mean, even smaller things, like if a character has really specific buttons or like a really specific necklace, and I know those are things that are already being done, but I think that that's just really cool what you can do, like exact replicas of stuff. Mm -hmm. Honestly, when I hear about 3D printing and cosplay, as you guys have mentioned, I get really, really excited about Ninja Flex and thinking about the potential of, you know, like this material that you can print that can bend and form and whatnot. And so the first thing I think of when I think of 
bendy wibbly wobbly is actually fins and so one thing i'm really excited for the potential for is printing like a mermaid tail out of ninja flex because one of the cosplays i'm hoping to do in the future is nami from league of legends and and i love that shit like <laughs> and I have like this giant. You know there, crush on there are other wings. like fandoms. Like <laughs> <laughs> there are no other fandoms. Oh, yeah, have you heard life. of Ruby or Rooster Teeth? <laughs> oh yeah, that, okay. Oh. Uh, you can't tell League of Legends people that. You really can't. Yeah, it's there are harmful. other games too. I have like, like a Kali Smite, Kamas. Uh... I can cut your head off with. Smite is not a game. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even begin to say Heroes of the Dota, Storm. Dota. Heroes. You hate it. <laughs> After the panel, we may or may not have an unofficial fight. Yeah, if you guys I don't know if like the hotel can provide us with battle, a cage. The Crescent Rose is right there, and I'm battle I've got ready. a Thor's hammer, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you ready? Yeah, I, can you? Yeah. No. Bring it. Cheater. One of the oh. things that I thought was really interesting with Ninja Flex was capes. Yes. Oh, printing yeah. capes. Because you've got that, like, Batman's cape, and then everything, like, the problem, there are so many problems, like, technical problems walking around a con with a cape <laughs> on is just the biggest pain in the butt. And just thinking about, like, a Ninja Flex being able to sort of, like, hold its own, but still be flexible and move around. Like, you, the idea you want of to be able to bend masks. Your head. Like, yeah. Turn your the head. classic domino mask. Uh, everybody hates that little bit of string. Mm -hmm. Or having to like, and you can attach, you'll still have to attach it with spirit gum. It doesn't just like magically stick to your face. <laughs> we'll get there in the future. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, so there is this, um, there is a, an attitude that is shared by a lot of cosplayers that uh, 3D printing is in some way cheating or that it doesn't involve as much work. Um, on the on the creative end um, and I know everybody here has a lot of different experiences many of those experiences including tearing out their own hair <laughs> to create their cosplay um, so I want to talk you know Jacob a little bit um, can you give us some insight into the post printing process of well how this works? I was actually I kind of wanted to hear what they said first and then follow up with uh, what <laughs> my ideas on that if it's cheating Perfect. or not what do you guys think can I do we all think no what? Like, <laughs> I don't no. think it's cheating. No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's cheating. I wouldn't consider it cheating. Because um, it still requires a skill set, and it yeah. still requires effort, and it still requires money. And, like, the idea that cosplay has to take the most amount of time and effort or else it's not cosplay doesn't make sense to me because I am so cheap, and I am so lazy, <laughs> and I will do things in the least amount of time and effort that they take as long as they look decent. So, I, like, the cosplay I do it technically doesn't fit under that definition either. <laughs> Um, I, I wouldn't consider it cheating. Um, I mean, yeah, like you said, it, it, it takes a certain set of skills and you still have to do the programming yourself if, you, if you're making something custom or find it and you still have to do it. Plus, there's still the painting involved and aging it, making it look the way that you want it to look and all that. So, no, it, it's, it's just another tool that can be used to, to make your cosplay even better. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's not cheating for a lot of reasons. I know you go and you ask about the post-printing process, but honestly, I think a good bit of it is the pre-printing and all the effort that goes into designing like a 3D model. And I know that's something that you need a lot of technical knowledge and talent for and something that right now I couldn't do myself and I really admire. Okay, so um, I can see that some judges would consider it cheating in certain ways, like under a certain set of circumstances. If you go out and buy like a Legend of Zelda like prop foam sword, and you bring that to competition, they're gonna know and they're gonna mark you off for it. You can, under a certain set of conditions, like if you buy if you buy a model online, find a model online, and then just print it and do nothing to it and bring that to competition, I would I would dock you. I would say no, no, you you put no effort in, you printed it. Like, but <clears throat> me for like that scythe, if if a if I brought that in front of a judge. And they said, no, you 3D printed it. I would be so angry. I would be livid because I designed that from scratch, just looking at Google Images. I printed it. Um, I actually, it's, it is an art form. Like, even just to get it onto the printer, you've got so many different settings that you can do. You have different infills, different ways to put it on the printer and print it. And then after that, I <laughs> freaking sanded it, put heart and blood and soul into it, and uh, painted it, did all the work for it. And if they told me it was crap, I'd be like, okay, why is it crap? It's 3D printed, I'd be livid. If they said, it's crap because I can see a line, I'd be like, okay, that's my fault. But if it was crap because it was 3D, because of being 3D printed, I'd be livid. No, that's ridiculous. I mean, honestly, when you talk about your post-printing process, it's like 
putting it all together, so assembly, sanding, priming, and painting, and that's exactly what we do with Warbler. That's what we do with EVA foam. That's what we do with craft foam. And honestly, I think besides the process of printing itself, both are pretty comparable. Yeah, you have to pattern if you're going to make a prop out of any of those other materials. So it's basically the same thing. You're just doing it on a computer. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different skill set. That's why, yeah, I think it takes just as much time, if not more. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that's really intriguing to me about the 3D printing versus like, you know, hand making is a lot of different materials that you use for hand, you know, your handmade cosplay stuff have negative benefits. Like you can't leave it in your hot car. Um, <laughs> for example, welcome to Texas cosplayers. Um, this is a, the, the struggle is real. Um, so, so real. you know, what, what, what kind of material benefits do you feel like 3D printing offers in terms of like, making your cosplay more functional at con lightweight first thing if you're making a six foot tall four foot wide scythe it's maybe 10 15 pounds you're carrying around that you're carrying a weapon around all day at conventions 10 hours sometimes so if you have something lightweight it's going to make your whole entire day better Soldiers carry around like 50 pound packs running through sand. I'm sure they don't want to carry around 55, like 50 to 100 pounds. And so. we don't want to be that authentic either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I carry a clipboard around in this costume and my arm gets sore from that. So, yeah. Pretty printer clipboard! <laughs> yeah. It's I just really wish light. I could it just print boots that like actually fit to my feet because these ones are hell. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a lot of uh, potential in 3D printing for shoes specifically. There's already people who they can scan your foot and model it to your foot. I thought it was Japan. Oh my god, China. shoes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Heels um, that don't hurt is the, is the big one. It's revolutionary. Hey, hey. Well, you could... Uh, uh, I, I feel like the 3D printed props and stuff are also less likely to fall apart. And maybe it's just how I'm making my props, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they seem like they're a lot more put together. They're one piece instead of a bunch of pieces put together with old duct tape and hot glue and wishes. Are there any like production benefits material wise that you could, that you could see 3D printing versus, you know, what you normally work with? Oh yeah. Um, certain materials can be very caustic too in the special effects field. I mean, uh, uh, self-skinning polyfoam, when you actually put the components together, forms a cyanide gas. So, yeah. That's fine. Uh, you, you really, 3D printing does not form any 3D, cyanide. Yeah, it's not going to create any cyanide. Um, so, yeah, you have to work uh, a lot of the materials that I use. I have to wear, wear a uh, rebreather, um, any of the, the stuff along those lines where I'm making props and things like that. I mean, they're chemicals that I'm mixing together. Even the, the two-part plastic, you really shouldn't be inhaling anything that comes off of those. And those do a chemical reaction and heat up really quickly as well. So, um, yeah, as far as like health benefits, definitely too. <laughs> so, yeah, I can Oliver see that could live a longer, healthier life. <laughs> yeah, I, I, printing. A, a lot of the chemicals that I use, I Increased wouldn't have to use. Increased life expectancy. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Level up. The future. <laughs> So another thing that is, is really intriguing about 3D printing, uh, this, this crescent rose does not fold up, but no. tell us a little bit about the actual like functionality options of 3D printing in uh, terms of like movable parts. Uh, you can do gears, mov movable parts. I did a, um, a uh, it's, I forget the name of it. It's like Earnhardt something heart, and it's like a geared heart that you can actually twist and move and stuff. So you can do movable parts. We just chose not to because we wanted to go for a different design on this one. Um, and then whenever you do a lot of movable parts, you want to keep mind of like physics and stress and what's going on. I mean, the scythe is a giant lever mm -hmm. and all that torque is right at that connector point between the staff. And so I've had a lot of problems with just its own weight. So, and then that's also part of the art of 3D printing is how much infill you want to do, how strong do you need a piece to be versus how lightweight do you want it. We tried to save a lot of plastic, and so some of the pieces are a lot weaker than what I would have wished, but that's just a miscommunication between me and uh, the person who was slicing at the time. I've since learned slicing, which is the in-between your uh, files and on the printer, but at the time I didn't know it, and he sliced it all wrong. So... <laughs> Oh no. So, so when it first comes off the printer, and now this, now Crescent Rose is 11 different pieces. Um, and this was put together in, in pieces and then, you know, painted and put together in pieces. Um, so in the process, when this comes off the printer, what 
what are you looking at and how does it look different from this? Because it doesn't come off the printer looking this way for sure. Uh, no, it does not. So <laughs> you've got, so when it, uh, it's got a raft on the printer, first of all, just in between the model and the bed, just to make it easier to pull off. And it's still kind of hard to pull off sometimes, but then you've got tons of support and support is for overhang. So certain pieces on there, like if anything, if it wasn't bottom supported, if it had overhang, there was a little tall tower of support sticking up to it. So everything's going to be from the base up, like just a tower. And then you pull off the supports and your models in the middle. Um, that's what, that's basically how it looks when it's on the printer. It's also whatever plastic color you're using. And then um, if you had to like change colors, so um, some of those pieces are actually multiple different colors of filament um, because they took so long that the spool we were using ran out. And so my boss would come in at four in the morning and filament swip, uh, swap, swap. <laughs> So you're still cosplaying at four in the morning, is what you're telling me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> See, and that's what makes cosplay, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you are up at the wrong end of four, there well, is no right end boss. of four in the morning. Right. Well, not me and my <laughs> <boss>. <laughs> wait, wait. So what you're saying is, with a 3D printer, I could be cosplaying at all hours. So technically, I could be like, man, I was working on this all night, but also have slept. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, okay, time to invest in a 3D printer. Yeah, right. yeah, at least you're like waking up at four in the morning to like do a thing. You can I'll actually, get some like, real like cosplayer street cred. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of attaching the pieces, um, I know there's a lot of different options for that. Um, what did you guys go with and what other ways are there of attaching pieces? We went with Gorilla Glue. <laughs> Lots of Gorilla Glue. Just like real cosplay! That sounds really yes. familiar. Gorilla Glue, I've since learned that there are better glues than Gorilla Glue. Contact Samantha. And I wish I had known that beforehand because that has broken apart a few times. And oh. it, like we were, we were filming an episode of For the Daily Dot and it <laughs> fell apart in the middle of our shoot. <laughs> and I was like, really? You fell like an inch. Like, and so, um, but what I since did is I broke it apart and I hammered in like a uh, wooden and metal dowel rods down the center of that staff to make it more structurally sound. But even then, that was still like, since I didn't model for that thought design in there, it's not the best. I've since redone the model so that there it'll it'll be it'll be perfectly able to just shove a rod through and then do some sort of expanding foam to put some pressure on in between the rod and then it'll be perfectly uh, stable. But most of the pieces, I, I tried to make it as much plastic as possible, and in certain areas, it's not the happiest. But that's not a fault of 3D printing. Uh, it's just a fault of the crescent rose being a giant lever. If I was doing a sword or anything like a huge, like uh, Silent Hill sword, I would have no problem because that's just a staff. All the weight is kind of distributed along. Um, you're, tra you're talking about like pyramid head. Right? Yes. Pyramid okay. Head. I always feel bad every time I see a cosplayer doing that costume because it feels like they are just carrying so much weight. I'm like, you've got to be yeah, ripped, and... dude. <laughs> it's, it's, it'll be a lot lighter than it would have been if you had you made it out of cardboard, out of any sort of wood, mm -hmm. metal even, if you're that diehard. So. <laughs> so are there any projects that you guys have done for your cosplay or your special effects in the past that now that you know about 3D printing, you're like, ah, if only. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do Ramona Flowers a lot, and she yes. carries around a giant hammer. And I have made two versions of that hammer. They're both not great. The first one was so heavy that every day that I wear that costume, my arms would be sore, my arms and my back. I'm not very strong, y'all. Uh, and then the second one I made out of uh, EVA foam, so it's a lot lighter and it's hollow on the inside, which I should have done from the beginning anyway. But it's like such a simple hammer. I feel like I could have 3D printed it in like way less time and it would have been so much lighter and a lot more structurally sound because I'm always like, don't touch it. <laughs> Just look. So, yeah. Appreciate it's, from afar. Don't touch it. Yeah. <laughs> look at it from this one angle. You're only allowed to look at it from one angle. While I was making it, I'm like, it only has to look good from one side. <laughs> Your prop has a good side. Yeah. I'll show you whenever I, I wear that costume that. next. <laughs> um, for me personally, I think the one thing I would want to go back and 3D print would definitely be the stars for Star Guardian Lux. Because for those of you guys that play League, the stars have this really specific rounded shape that you're not really gonna find anywhere else if you try to like mold something off of a star or something like that and so when I was doing my warbla I kind of molded it on top of a base metal star and then tried to reshape it and it didn't go as well as I wish it would have and it definitely didn't go as well as it would have if I could have 3d printed it off of the models that you can actually pull from the client 
So I'm a little booty hurt about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, uh, not any of my cosplays in particular, but I would love to have it when I'm building uh, animatronics uh, robots because you build a lot of your own custom machine pieces. You got to machine a lot of it. If I could do lightweight machinery pieces, oh man, that would I, I could I could make an animatronic real fast. So that would be awesome. Well, and you've got an animatronic Michelangelo. Uh, his head was, was, well, it's puppet constructed, but yeah, but uh, the Krang is completely, okay. yeah, it's completely robotic, remote controlled. He was, he was a full animatronic. And so every part inside of him, with the exception of the servos themselves, I had to custom make. So, yeah. That's actually another really great <clears throat> use of 3D printing mm -hmm. is in, um, like, uh, amputees limbs yes, for exactly. yeah and um, also like if you want to do Plus Edward that, Elric or yeah. something like you can make really lightweight <laughs> yes oh, yeah, yeah that would be cool and like, actually yeah I, I used to work for a robotics company up in New York um, doing skins that would go over robotic limbs and a lot of those pieces now they're starting to do a lot more of the 3d printing for it as a matter of fact uh, Utari in Fort Worth um, UTA's robot or uh, research institute they have a bunch of these printers, and that's what they use to machine a lot of the robotic parts, their gears and things along those lines. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can... So then gears, you think about that, and all sorts of steampunk applications, too. So, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. We're actually, we're actually we're having someone 3D print a steampunk 3D printer. So. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Wait, I so know. meta! 3D printer, <laughs> 3D printer I, I don't think my brain understood that, but okay. <laughs> 3D printception, is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. Um, oh my gosh, there was a question, and then you in my head, and then you made a joke, and now I forgot. It. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. So, as far as like um, special effects, and uh, you know, definitely with robotics, but is there anything else that you can think of that you know, three D printing would help with in terms of like moving effects? Um, in terms of oh yeah, I mean, like, well, going off the the animatronic stuff, you have animatronic parts that'll go on people as well. I mean, all of your the classic Ninja Turtles and all that, they, all of their pieces, their heads were full animatronic pieces that were worn by the performer. So if you could make it more lightweight, not using any metals, um, and be able to to create that inside, man, you'd make it a lot. The the performers would enjoy that a lot more. That's for sure. If it was a little <laughs> more lightweight. Um, I mean, Iron Man, I mean, look at his stuff. A lot of that stuff that was custom sculpted and done when that first came out. Oh, man, they, I'm sure they could have lots of Iron Man suits ready to go. I feel like Christian Bale would have had, like, an easier time yeah. if that really terribly heavy, very cumbersome bat suit was actually well, and, and that's the thing. Uh, you could do certain parts of it, because I don't know if there's a lot that you could get around with, say, a bat suit. Like, your armor pieces, your, your individual plating, things like that, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. And that would probably uh, relieve a lot of the weight, too, that you're having to carry around, because they're doing a lot of that in latex or even silicone. And when you start to add up that material, it gets really heavy. Um, I remember my buddy that was the Ninja Turtle in the Casey Jones movie. Uh, he, he was not happy with me for a long time. <laughs> Especially when they had to, like, get under, like, get in the sewers and get in water and stuff like that. And then it started, then, like, the undersuit started to retain water while they were having to move oh. in the latex. It was, it was not fun for them. And, and then the performers that had to do the, the martial arts and all of that kind of stuff, the, the jumps and kicks and all of that. Um... A creature like that, it's going to be a little bit harder. Uh, this one's saying that the certain pieces you could do, perhaps the shell, I don't know, you know, doing that kind of thing, and that could probably alleviate some of the weight because that was a polyfoam shell that we made, and most of the ones that they do are, are polyfoam shells. And um, though the polyfoam is very lightweight, especially when you make weapons, but you, you really, when you're doing something like that, you need to make something that's, that's fairly rigid, um, a baseball bat, um, swords, things like that. That way you can smack each other with them pretty easily and not have to worry about it. But... Um, for the shell, you could probably do that, and um, it's just it's the it, once the materials they can start printing, and how pliable can you get with it? I mean, can you get as pliable as say a, a dragon skin? Um, with certain piece. materials, yes. With certain materials, Ninja Flex will, so. will have a lot more have a lot of good uses for that. Lost your oh, blood uh, thank you. Some of my blood came off. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Oh, yeah, so, this, so then, yeah. this is pretty strong. Like I could smack some people with yeah. this, and not saying I have, but I have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and have you looked at that yet? No, I have not. Okay, it's very. I light. thought I wasn't should... supposed to be able. It's, to. No, it's no, really. Light. I'm worthy. No. You are so <laughs> worthy. Everyone on this panel, everyone in this room is probably worthy. Oh, of course. Yeah, but it's, it's really special. Everyone. Is it everyone's? Yeah. Uh, well, mostly. mostly. It's got a mesh mm -hmm. infill. 
Oh, okay. That's so cool. it, looks like, it looks like a mesh layer. So yeah, I can see eventually being able to do body suits and stuff like that uh, for creatures. That would be very, oh man, that would save a lot of time. That would save a lot of time. So on the flip end of this, uh, not just the, like, this is what I'm wearing to the con, are there any applications? You know, one of the cool things that I saw was a lot of people are um, 3D printing uh, paintbrush grips, things like that. Are there any, have you ever considered, like, the, you know, um, pre-production stuff, like, applications of cosplay? Have you ever thought about that? Or, Jacob, mm -hmm. do you have any light to shed on that? Um... Can you can you say the question again? That's like, a terrible question. <laughs> it's, it was All a very questions. long question. It was I got lost long along the trail. So so there are. Um, can you think of or suggest any you know pre costume ways that three D printing could be used? For example, you know paintbrush grips that kind of um, thing. Yeah, you could make um, the like foam heads or whatever that you could put your masks on and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, like body props, uh, stands, anything. You can make like any furniture you want. Uh, dress form. Yeah, exactly. Oh my yeah. god, That'd dress form so in my size. Nice. A perfect, like, fit to you dress form. Yes. Yeah, if any of you have ever used a dress form, like, <laughs> even if you can get the measurements right, which you usually can't, like, I'm in between two different size mannequins, so one will have, like, half my measurements and the other has the other half. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if you get those right, like, the, the distance between, like, your bust and their waist and whatever never lines up, so anything you put on there just looks wrong. Like, it's helpful for many things, but it's never going to be a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. If you could get a perfect fit mannequin, like, you should get into that business because you would make right. a lot of money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, one thing that uh, a friend of mine did, she has, a like, a home 3D printer, like, a much smaller one than the one that we're talking about. But she needed to do stamps for a uh, skirt that she was making that had, like, a print all around the edge. So she actually 3D designed them and 3D printed the stamps, and she used those to stamp the design with fabric paint. Oh, that's so cool. cool. Yeah, that's I was like, that's smart, because she made them out of foam, too, but she said the foam, like, didn't look as good, because it didn't, it wasn't as, like, uh, exact. Yeah. And going off that, uh, the whole mannequin thing, the, the custom one, um, for certain creature suits, you, you, you end up with a lot of binding when you end up having the, the character move their arm up here. So a piece where I could actually sculpt it on and be able to work it with the custom mannequin and know that I'm not going to get that binding that's going to happen, that would be fantastic. I've always really wanted to 3D print all of the action figures that I want that will <laughs> probably <laughs> never actually be merchandised. Like, there's yes. just, when uh, when yes. Legend of Korra wrapped up, right. and I was like, they almost had Korra saw me kiss! I could 3D print that action figure. <laughs> 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 I could 3D print that. I think that might be the best application we've talked about today. Right? <laughs> just making action figures that Custom you want. Custom toys. Kind right? of pirating a little bit, but not really. No, no, they don't yeah, we could have our own little robot chicken with all of our 3D printed models and just... <laughs> <laughs> So now, as far as 3D printing goes, the technology is moving incredibly quickly. Um, you know, it, I know that, you know, Jacob, you said you've been doing this for, for a short period of time and the technology has changed since you were in high school and is now different. Um, how quickly would you say that technology is moving and, and can you, how do you feel like the future of 3D printing is looking? Um, that's actually a really hard question. Uh, you have to, have to think about that for a second. Um, <laughs> Well, it was, it's more of like there's different types of printers. Like, I've had so many people ask me about like metal printers and stuff, and metal printing is just messy right now. Like, it's messy. It's, it's using welding techniques, and you need like master welders to make something not look like crap when you're welding. Um, but the technology is actually, it's, it is moving very quickly. Um, I can't tell you what the future holds because I can't look into it. Do um, it. <laughs> Give it a shot. No pressure. <laughs> um, but I mean, I've had people come up and ask me if like we're gonna start 3D printing food, and there's yeah. that idea is definitely out there. Like, oh, yeah. hey, can you print me a pizza? No, not right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I heard you guys did 3D print a pumpkin. Not a real pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> it was made out of plastic. Well, I've heard about like uh, I don't know. Like eventually we'll be able to watch a TV show, and if you're like, oh, I really like that dress that woman's wearing, you can just buy it from your TV and have it 3D printed in your home, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a future I really want to live in. It kind of scares me, but it's also kind of really cool. <laughs> oh, see, that's totally, like, that's totally a future I want to live in. I'm like, ah, oh, that I would, I would just, like, go back and, like, really rewatch Mad Men, and every time Christina Hendricks was on film, I'd be like, that, that, and I'm broke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you only have two things, yeah. and then that's but your whole life saving. Right. Right. <laughs> So that, that's always, so is there anything that can't be printed right now that you feasibly see being attainable 
food. in the near future. Fish. Yeah, say food. Yeah, food. We'll feed you after the panel, Bianca. You're the best. I, can, I, can I get some food with you, too? I mean, <laughs> um, you have to print it. I want <laughs> yeah. or I an actual pumpkin this time. Um, titanium has, like, whenever they get to the point where, like, titanium can be on, like, a molecular scale, like, set up in the most strong way possible, and then when you can start printing it, it'll be, like, super lightweight. It'll be used for construction, and it would be amazing. It would be super lightweight, insanely strong. Um, like, it would be stronger than something four times as heavy as, as it. Just different, like, metal polymers. Like, that's, I can definitely see that happening in the future. On top of, people are already using... 3D printers to prototype and make like machines and stuff. Once we get those all these fancy metals and have those be able to like be printed on molecular levels, like right now we print at like by a half a millimeter is like kind of the resolution. Um, but once you get those, you can do so many crazy different things with it. Uh, actually, the first question I was asked when we started was, "What do you want to print?" And I had no answer because there's everything that's out there. <laughs> right. So like, you just gotta narrow it down and think about it. Also pizza? <laughs> yes, pizza. Sure. Pizza. Mia, is there anything that, that I feel you like think ordering of? a pizza would be a lot faster than mm. waiting on one to print. I mean, like the Crescent Rose took 150 hours. Yes. <laughs> but uh, it will get faster, uh, Better right? be a damn good slice um, of pizza. Maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Promise. The, the print time is actually kind of specific like the you can't do much to change the print time because it's already you maximize for the best print and so your temperature would be set to that your print speed would be set to you want the best print to come out mm. and so like if you print it faster it's going to be messy well for pizza gonna... that's okay well yeah i can for... do a messy pizza <laughs> yeah we really we you really want pizza up here you straight here I haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> uh, as far as stuff that I want to see, I've heard about 3D printed organs and stuff, and I think that is the coolest. Yeah. Like, I want to see more medical applications. Like, as much fun as the cosplay and the, like, clothing and the pizza is. Like, I think it would be really cool once we start getting that kind of as a mainstream application of 3D printing. You, you can actually do uh, perfect hip <laughs> joints or bone joints mm -hmm. because they can print inside of each other. So, oh. like, if you print people who need, like, a, bo a hip replacement, you can do a perfect ball-in joint because it's already printed inside of each other. You don't have to uh, have two halves that you screw together. And so it's actually really, it's great for use in the medical field. Um, I was talking to my bosses, like, you can, um, so, like, plastic surgeon stuff, like, when people, like, do, like, uh, change their gender, like, their jawbone, they get, a lot of times they have a surgery on their jawbone to change the shape. And so you could 3D print out the shape you want um, make a wax casting and probably and like grow coral in there and coral is almost a perfect replacement for bone So you can do lots of crazy stuff in the medical field with 3d printing That's awesome. That's fantastic. Do they already have like different materials that are safe for internal use? Uh, yes, yeah I don't know the specifics on that one, but... What kind of world do we live in? This is just magic. <laughs> so cool. Bianca's trying to get metal legs. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. I know. I'm sorry. I just watched way too much Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> There's no such thing. <laughs> Dude, if I could have my own personal Winry to help me out with everything, like, life would be great. So Can we 3D print one? I figure that we'll, you know, open the floor up to questions for uh, for a little while and see if anybody has any thoughts or if we can shed any light on anything. Um, but do you guys have any final thoughts on 3D printing and its capabilities and what you'd like to see? In the world? I feel like we kind of really. I want a Nightwing or... mask. That's I it. I just want a Nightwing mask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, scanners. Scan your face. Please. Yeah. That's Model actually the first thing I thought of yeah. was the Ms. Marvel domino mask. I can't tell you how many times I've gone online to like look at a tutorial for domino mask and they're like, this is really hard and you're going to F it up at least 10 times before you get it right. <laughs> yeah. Well, does anybody have any questions? Here, I'll come to you. Yay. That's why we need 20 minutes to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> She actually broke her legs so that the, the her the costume would work. Like super so, that right. the so she could use the cane. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, well, well, first things first. This might not be the most exciting team name, but it has all the letters. Uh, <gasps> door jam. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> door jam. 
And then uh, my other question is, since most of us don't work for a studio or don't have access to a huge printer, what are some of the smaller projects that you've seen on like the $300 or the $400 3D printers that are much smaller, but um, you know, are still, that are much more within the realm of, of maybe, you know, laymen getting a hold of? Belt buckles. Jewelry. Buttons. Black masks mask from um, Arkham Origins. Hair clips. Ooh. Any any kind of accessory. <laughs> I mean, if you can if you can separate your model into enough pieces, you can print mm -hmm. anything. But and just like put it well, together like a Gundam. Glue, like yeah, a... why would you want to glue four hundred <laughs> little Minecraft blocks together for? Yeah. <laughs> and real life. Because we're passionate. <laughs> <laughs> also, I was wondering, uh, do you know of any online services that let people who can't afford to buy the huge huge printers? Uh, yes, or is we that... do. You guys do. Three okay. D hubs. Three D hubs. A it what it, it's a service that gets you in contact with someone who has a three D printer in your area and then you can negotiate with that person pricing for plastics materials the, the cost of their time the cost of time uh for electricity like you can debate with them mm -hmm. and uh there's also a lot of maker spaces uh yes like uh on ut on campus we have a maker space and then like there's a tech shop up in round rock it's a great place for yeah just find a 3D printer. Yeah, if you just Google like makerspace in the city that you live in, you should be able to find one in your area. Thank you. Well, this is a question. Double question. Which version of Nightwing? Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> They're all really hot. Like, <laughs> come on, don't do that to me. Who I cares about anything other than hotness? I mean. Oh yeah. But I think he's super badass. Like, he used to be in the circus with his family, and he, he has, like, the awesome pew. You will not tolerate any Nightwing hate. I'm going to go ahead and use my mod authority. <laughs> <laughs> Nightwing is bae. Just say classic or new 52. Like. Okay, we're going to go with classic. Like, he was my first bae, but okay. Uh, my next question is, can you use multiple colors in one print? Yes. You um, did. So there, um, usually it would be a filament swap. But that would be like on that layer, and then everything above that layer would be the new color. That's if you only have one head. We do have a new uh, dual head extruder where you can use two different colors, and then um, it gets a lot more complex from there. But usually, two colors is what most uh, 3D printers, you say, at most will have. I've never seen anything with more than three or four heads. Um, but two colors, and then really, it's not. Like, you don't need more than one head. Post, pr I did the scythe, like, you just, you cover it in a spray paint primer, primer that sticks to the plastic, and then paint it yourself, like, usually. I mean, that's, that's the best way to go about it. And that's a lot easier than trying to get the colors to work together? Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it looks real good. Yeah. <laughs> what other questions do we have? I was just wondering, you mentioned a bunch of 3D programs, but you didn't mention Sculptress. Is that a good program to use if you want to get into 3D printing? I haven't used it, actually. I haven't even heard of it until you just asked me that question. I will now look into it, but um, a lot of people, uh, 3D Max, uh, a lot of people I've heard been using that. Actually, a lot of people like have been showing me their own custom like 3D stuff that they've made on 3D Max that are like ruby props and stuff, which I've actually had like four or five people Hook come me up to up. me now. <laughs> Maya. Maya. Maya's a great, absolutely great, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> it is a bitch. Yes. Uh, yes it, is. Yeah. it is great for animating, and uh, when I was got, I got the chance to go into stage five and tour Rooster Teeth offices, I looked over and all the animators, like they're sitting in their black suits with dots all over it because they're going to go into the other room and do karate and stuff. But they're all on all their screens. Most of them had Maya up. Um, it's great for animating. You usually don't want to make your models in Maya because it has one of the steepest learning curves I've ever seen. Like I don't use it, and I. Yeah, I mean, once you once you learn it, it is a, it's you can do anything you want with it, but. With any kind of cutting, I think it's, it, at the end of the day, it's what you're most comfortable with, because that's what, you know, I mean, no, if you know the program and you know it works and you're comfortable with it, then you're probably, because of your comfortability, you're probably going to create a better design because of your comfortability and, and your knowledge base. Is there a specific program you'd recommend for beginners? Uh, any CAD. Nice. CAD is really easy. You make a sketch and you extrude it. You can make a, it's, it's super easy. Um, when you get to stuff like organics like if you want to make a tree that's when it gets hard mm -hmm. like um it's 
I, I haven't had much success with organics. Uh, my bosses actually use uh, a program called Rhinoceros. I haven't actually used it myself, but they've had a lot of great uses for that. Um, but the, the best stuff I've seen is usually like somebody used a 3D scanner to scan something that's already been made in real life mm -hmm. and converts it like point by point into the computer program. That's fancy. Yeah. Question? In terms of like the um, the smaller like home 3D printers, do you think it's better to uh, get into it now or wait a few years when it's a little bit cheaper and the technology is a little bit better? Um, if you're if you're just going for the if you're worried about the cost, that you you would wait for it. Um, but I would say just familiar familiarize yourself with the costs and the material, like how you would go about doing it first, and then that's a personal decision. If anything, um, you could learn how to model now. Yeah, yeah. with with any sort of technology, the, the longer time goes on, the cheaper it gets, or the more innovations have been made. But we're at a good point. I mean, 3D modeling has been around for maybe like 10, 15 years now, but like it was only like three or four years ago that it really started picking up. Uh, I know you guys have touched on this a little bit already, but um, in terms of CAD programs specifically, uh, any recommendations on stuff that's, it, all the kind of big engineering ones are thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, any recommendations for ones that are not even free, just you know, a couple hundred bucks or with a special hobbyist license or anything like that? Um, that's actually a really, that's a hard one too. Onshape is free, actually. So it's a beta. It's a beta CAD software called Onshape. It's actually what I used for both of these. Um, I touched on it earlier, um, but it's it's a it's a CAD software. It's very oriented for gears, mechanical shapes, and stuff, which is actually really great for weapons and prop weapons and armor because most of the time stuff will be symmetric and square and blocky. Um, that's I was able to create those with it, and you can kind of see the results. Um, as far as other CAD softwares, I mean, I used Inventor, um, but that is I had a student license, so like going to sometimes it's easier to enroll at like one class at ACC, get their license or whatever, and then you could draw like you, you get that license for it's either a year or a few years depending on what all you get if you get the whole entire package with it and stuff. I don't suggest doing that. I mean, <laughs> but I have, I know people who have done that. Such good questions, you guys. You guys are doing great. You are doing great. Good audience. Good Thank audience. Thank you. Oh, oh, you meant them. <laughs> um, I've got a few things. Um, the 3D printing on the atomic scale. We kind of can actually do that, but it's really slow and really costly. You can pick up atoms and move them around and send them down and do that stuff, but it's really only for research labs. Yeah. Um, also, titanium, super, super reactive with everything. I was, I was using that as an example. Yeah. I, I, um, I can't think of... I, I've looked into it, and there was a name of some metal that they were actually trying to, like, on a molecular scale, set it up into, like, triangles, because triangle is, like, the strongest shape in nature. Okay. Um, like, but I don't remember the name, so it's just as reaching into space in my yeah. brain. And... Yeah. I was predicting the future, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I can only do so much. Yeah. Um, also, what materials out there um, would you recommend to work with or and or print with? So right now PLA is my favorite, um, especially for large like prop things because ABS, although it is like it's it's good, you can do a lot of stuff with ABS the same as any other plastic material. ABS likes to warp once you get about six inches in height into any print and um, it's, it's cooling factor. So you heat up the plastic and the plastic will literally cool as you're printing. That's why you have the heated bed to kind of help try and fight that. But the uh, when it, it expands and it contracts when it gets colder. So when you're in the middle of your print with ABS, we've seen a lot of it with ABS specifically, um, it'll the bottom will contract while you're printing. And so when you suddenly had parts that were bottom supported, they're no longer bottom supported because the bottom just got skinnier. Um, PLA is what we've been using, and I absolutely love working with PLA. It's been consistent. I had almost no errors whatsoever when printing this. I had one where my boss forgot to 
like walked in a few hours late and uh the it had already run out of filament so we had to do some creative stuff with that but um pla is great to use only thing with pla is the texas summer sun will punish you i was letting something dry outside and it completely warped and had i like gotten home like 15 minutes earlier because i just went to run a chore but that's the first time i ran into warping so i didn't know it would do that but it it's easy. If you leave something in your car, it'll warp. So you have to be very conscious with warping. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Um, is it possible to do a uh, round object? Yes. Yeah. So so <laughs> most um, so most softwares, whenever you make a, a circle, a sphere, will create it in polygons, and then you can change like how many polygons for how round it is. And then you would export it into whatever um, software in between you, the STL file and uh, your printer. And then that'll also do some stuff to your model to try and um, make it easier to print. Um, but it usually doesn't mess up on this. So I have circles, circular shapes on this scythe up here if you want to look at it afterwards. But you can kind of see a little bit of how it did the polygons. But you can do, re you can do circles if you need to. You can set it up to say, I want this to be a perfect sphere or whatever, if you need to. But most of the time, it's not too big of a deal. If you have like a, a round shape, could you sand it down to make it rounder like yes. after it's printed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I've, I've actually done that. Yeah, a lot. Hi. Um, I'm in game art and design modeling. So um, I'm used to like whenever I need to make something mechanical, you can just fake it because it doesn't need to actually work. Um, for making 3D props that actually can open and shut and, you know, work mechanically, do you guys have any tips or tricks uh, that we would want to know? Um, my first thing would be don't just use plastic. I wanted to, I, I was trying to be ambitious with the scythe, and I wanted to be only plastic, everything 3D printed. Um, I messed up on some of the the, uh, the slicing of the, the pieces, and so now some of the pieces, the only reason we're not letting you pick it up, it's a prototype, and some of the joints are weaker than I wanted them to be. And I really wanted them to be nice. I've had parts that broke a few times. Use multiple different materials. I, at the end, as like a try to sol solve the problem, I broke it in half, like broke pieces apart, sh hammered in wooden dowel rods and metal dowel rods through the piece, put it back together and tried to cover up so it wouldn't look so broken. Um, but just like from the get-go, if you know it's going to be big, you know it's going to be heavy, try and find something like just lightweight and something different. Like you're going you're gonna to want to use the plastic for like really precise shapes and designs. Let something else bear all the weight. So one of the things that I uh, saw online when I was researching 3D printing and everything like that was something called stereolithography, and that was printing like using the laser instead of an extruder. Um, do you guys see any viable future in that sort of thing, or do you think that will take off ever? I don't know too much about that. I've seen probably the same thing you did. Um, my, my immediate thoughts on that is that it's using so it's, it's going to be super precise because it's literally shooting in light rays of like uv light rays to harden the plastic or whatever but i imagine the liquid that they're using for to like shoot the rays through is incredibly expensive so unless you're making something super tiny your costs just go through the roof um i can possibly see a future i like i've, I've been thinking about that a lot actually because they don't like use supports in the traditional manner because um like, I don't know how they would do supports, actually. Because you're still going to need supports from bottom or top. Like, just if you flip something upside down. Because I'm I, assuming the video you saw is where they're pulling the, like, uh, uh, Eiffel Tower out of the resin. Um, like, if you needed... Uh, you did, That particular model wouldn't need supports. But if you have anything that's, like, just not bottom supported at all, they have to print support still. So I have no clue how they do that. Um, I just don't... Personally, I think this is the best form. Uh, the hot glue gun extruder is probably my favorite. I've had the best results with it. With the cost of uh, the different materials and things, do you think it would be cost effective to make little action figures and uh, cosplay props and things like that and sell them online? 
Um, yeah, I think so. Um, we have a few people who bought our Gigabots and started companies around their 3D printing. Um, the 3D hubs, again, people have made profits buying Gigabots from us. Like, within months. Within, like, I think the shortest I heard was, like, somebody did it, like, repaid off their Gigabot and made a profit within as little as a month. Um, if you're gonna make, like, but if you want to do, like, large-scale stuff, like, it does take time. The biggest cost with a 3D printer is time. Um, it takes time to do stuff. We have a board in our office. We have, like, three gigabots available to us in our Austin office, a lot more in the Houston office, but we have a strict schedule, and, like, we even have a week of the year, of the summer called, like, intern brawl for print time. Um, <laughs> Where we, like, are just sitting there arguing, I want to print, I need to print, or, like, hey, my print was unexpectedly long, I just took your entire day. Um, so, there are prints like that, but also, uh, the, the PLA is great for wax casting. So, you can print out models, wax cast it, and make, and then just keep using that wax cast. Like, when you pour molten in, it perfectly burns out PLA. And so, you can make, like, really amazing, um metal models off of it and stuff mm -hmm. that being said if you've ever made other props like not 3d printed but just did the whole fun eva foam expanding foam whatever that's really expensive too i know for my commas i had to make two of them but really i made four of them because i messed up a lot <laughs> they ended up costing around 300 dollars, maybe 400 even and at that point you may as well print them and not fuck up <laughs> yeah, and um, I know a lot of people that do cosplay when they make stuff out of like resin, which is another very expensive material, they will make more and then sell them online because it's just a lot more cost effective. The way that the material works is you end up with a lot extra and you've already done the hard part, which is creating the mold. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to me that if I were going to make like, let's say like a necklace from Game of Thrones or something and I was going to 3D print it at home, I'd probably 3D print a couple others and put them on Etsy. I don't know that I would do anything large scale because that seems hard to ship and hard to like guarantee that it won't fall apart. But something smaller like that, I can ab absolutely see people doing like a business based on it. Yeah, I actually saw someone on Etsy that's 3D printing super intricate Pokeballs. <laughs> and I think it's the coolest thing. That is cool. Yeah, I definitely think it's viable, but I do think the wax casting you were mentioning would probably be the most cost efficient way because of the cost of the plastic, the electricity and so on and so forth. I think with, you know, especially with it taking X degree or, or being kind of time consuming, I guess, you know, it, it's very similar to a lot of other props. Like Mia was saying, people making props and resin casting, those things are very, very commonly referred to as limited edition because that person only has so much time to make and paint and, and finish product and sell five or six of them, you know, immediately within a certain space of time. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm intrigued with scanners and how they're going to play with 3D printers now. In particular, people are taking like connects and turning them into scanners. Um, I recently saw like HP released a scanner, a 3D scanner, uh, still around three grand, so a little prohibitive, but still it seems like the market's starting to lean towards scanners, starting to play into the market. So I just want to get your thoughts. Um. There's an app you can get on certain phones, and you're, you can use your phone as a 3D scanner. I have one of my bosses does that. Um, what's the name? I have no clue. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, what's it called? 123 one, Catch. That's cute. Um, I don't know, I don't know oh what God. phone specifically. So I would cute. imagine probably a Samsung phone. Uh, more. He has an iPhone? Oh, okay. So iPhones too. Uh, <laughs> But um, as far as like professional grade scanners, I don't know how much they cost and I have never actually used one. I know people are using a lot of cool ones. People have like uh, scanned like the Easter Island statues, like with a ladder, like it would just like a hand scanner and done models off that. I went to Fax Prime and they had like a full body scanner where you'd like step in and they'd 3D print a little version of you. Wait, at Be oh, Pax Prime. Yeah. I thought you said Bex Prime. I'm like, why does a burger place have that? <laughs> <laughs> the best burgers. Yeah. You don't even know. <laughs> I was yeah, very surprised. Tailored to your anatomy. Apparently, I'm hungry. You need to do pizza now. <laughs> pizza and hamburgers. Hamburger pizza. Okay. Oh Ooh. my god. I think we have, we have time for one more question. We have time for one more question. Fight for it. 
say that. I'm the moderator. Yeah, she's, she's the moderator. <laughs> I'm sorry. Have you been talking the last ten minutes? <laughs> <laughs> we only have two. Come on. On the note of uh, mechanical and moving parts, do y'all know of any online resources similar to uh, like McMaster Car? There you are. <laughs> I was looking for you. I was like, who's saying? Um, I'm not actually sure. I know like a lot of people are using SolidWorks at my college. Is that what you mean, like uh, 3D softwares or? Oh, tutorials. You can do a lot of a lot of softwares have assembly options, so you can put all of your different mechanical pieces together and see how they work. If they will end up being like it's like a physics simulator in a lot of them, and they do a great job. Um, We've posted the scythe files online, and I have an assembly for that. So it's 11 different pieces, and I put them in an assembly file, assembled them with all the constraints and stuff. So, like, they can, like, different pieces can twist around and stuff. It's, it's yeah, it's got great uses in mechanical moving parts and stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we have a, uh, okay, so uh, for this scythe, um, and for the hammer, too, we, I have a blog, and I've posted all of the files online publicly free. Um, on Sketchfab and on Onshape, which is the program I was using. Um, so you can get the files yourself and print them yourself if you Where's want. Where's this it. blog? Uh, it's on re3d.org. <laughs> Re3d, the most amazing place ever. Uh, dot org. Thank it is. Come by so our booth. Much. Yeah, thank you guys so much for your questions. If you have any additional questions, you know, we'll be out in the hallway. Um, but thank you guys so much for coming to the panel. We hope you got. What a great yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have cards. Someone take a card. Oh yeah, we have cards up here for, for her. Me. Yeah. For my stuff, <laughs> if you're interested. No pressure. Pick your favorite, it's fun. <laughs> you can pick up the hammer if you